Okay, so many thanks again. Her seat at the table, 20th Century Women Designers to the Present. I just want to take this moment of introduction to really graciously thank each and every one of you who have joined myself and my colleague, Rachel Delphia, on this journey of fabulous, fantastical, and phenomenal female designers in working in ceramics, working in lighting, working in industrial design as an overall field, and today focusing on furniture specifically. But as with all of the sessions, you'll see overlap. There are some designers you've already met in the past three sessions. There are some designers that work in all three of the mediums that we've drawn out. Um, and there are some designers who had to find innovative ways during their particular moment of work to get their vision uh, and their voice heard and then there are those that unfortunately their vision and voice haven't been heard until late of recent scholarship that has unearthed the vast impact that they had on industrial design and furniture design specifically with today. So again, my name is Alyssa Velasquez, Curatorial Assistant of Decorative Arts and Design at Carnegie Museum of Art. And I am so happy to be joining all of you as audience members this time. So you get a break from hearing the tonality of my voice uh, and you get to listen in on the wonderful wisdom uh, and research and, and deep dive into female furniture designers by my wonderful office mate and collaborator, Rachel Delphia. So I'll turn it over to Rachel. Thank you, thank you, Alyssa. Um, and we are we are not office mates at this very second because then our sound conflicts with each other. Um, but indeed, I wanna thank all of you as well. This has been um, a lot of fun. And um, for us, as well as we hope for all of you, revisiting designers that Alyssa and I certainly knew of, but some of them in more depth than others. So thank you for letting us uh, refresh our own memories of these really wonderful women. So um, today I'm kicking off session four, taking a seat, uh, women furniture designers. And I will say that this session is um, near and dear to my heart because I am actually a woman furniture designer and woodworker, um, not as a career, obviously, as I sit here as curator, but I did train in furniture design as an undergraduate and my house is full of many objects that I've made and um, the basement is a mess of a wood shop. So um, I share a lot of, um, of empathy with the women working in this field, which can be actually quite physically taxing uh, as, well as, um, as well as creatively. So uh, as Alyssa said, many of the women that you'll see today um, worked across different media. And so they are cropping up again in, um, cropping up again in our, our syllabus. So first off is the Irish designer and architect Eileen Gray. And we saw her last week with Alyssa's uh, presentation about women in lighting design. So Gray was, uh, was born in Ireland. She was born into quite an aristocratic family. And so uh, early pictures of her are quite feminine, showing her in the, or quite traditionally feminine in the Victorian model in flowing dresses with her hair swept up into a bun. You can see the contrast here to how she chose to style and present herself as a modernist designer in the 1920s, the blunt cropped haircut, which is more androgynous, more masculine. Indeed, the clothing that she wore, um, that she chose to wear we're all part of presenting herself as many other women, um, modern women did um, in a way that was, um, that was more cutting edge and, um, and I think not insignificantly masculine as they, as many of them are trying to break into and um, succeed within male dominated fields. So when Gray was 20 years old in 1900 or 22 years old, sorry, in 1900, uh, she was very desperate to escape the strictures of this um, upper class Irish household that she was born into. And so she renounced marriage and declared her desire to move to Paris and to be an artist. And fortunately for her, her father was an amateur artist. And so he actually supported this and um, 
and supported her financially to make this possible. So she moved to Paris in 1902 and pursued various studies and really um, folded into a creative circle of many individuals. And by 1910, she had opened a studio in Paris in collaboration with Seizo Sujawara, a Japanese sculptor and a lacquer specialist. And he was just one of many artisans that she would partner with over time. She also worked with a very talented Japanese ebony worker, Kachizo Inagaki, and many, many others. So she learned not only about furniture design and woodworking, but also about dyeing Moroccan leather, weaving tapestries. Uh, she was really a polymath and was interested in um, the total interior, the Gesamtkunstwerk, the, the total work of art where um, she's designing at times the architecture, or if not, if not the architecture, the complete interior, including all of the unique furnishings within. So one of the one of the things that really distinguishes her career, uh, I think, are her materials. She used um, really a balance of of exceptional luxurious materials like lacquer, but also um, the materials of modern design like chromed tubular steel. And she brings these together in really beautiful ways. So um, lacquer, again, became in particular an early signature of her work. This is an incredible um, chaise or you know, lounging piece of furniture for lounging that is made in the shape of a, um, of a, a indigenous American, South American pirogue or a, a, like a canoe, um, certainly with the feet added to support it as a piece of furniture. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to tell in this view, but the exterior is a deep um, brownish black lacquer and the interior is actually lacquered with gold leaf. So it's this beautifully luxurious object. And in fact, you can see it on the right hand side pictured in situ with the rocket lamp that Alyssa showed us, as well as a screen, a lacquer screen by Gray. So I mentioned she also worked in um, more, more modern and um, uh, more machine age materials like steel and, and sheet metal. So here are two tables that she designed in the 1920s. The one on the right is more of a one-off in um, very architectural in shape. If you think about her practicing as an architect as well, you can see how this, uh, this table on the right is almost like a miniature building. And then on the left, this is an adjustable table that she designed. So the top actually goes, um, uh, you can pull out a pin and you can raise and lower it. So this can be a low table or it can be a higher table relative to the piece of uh, seating furniture that you place it next to. And this table is actually still produced by some manufacturers today. So the, the piece on the left is probably the, the gray design that you're most likely to come across. Uh, although certainly modern reproductions um, or modern issues uh, don't have nearly the value that the earliest pieces do. So we mentioned that a number of these women did not receive uh, accolades or recognition in their lifetime. And that was certainly the case for Eileen Gray. She was undoubtedly valued by her clients and, um, and, and also impressed in some of the, the salons and exhibitions where she showed in Paris, during her, particularly during her early working years. Um, but by the time, um, by the time uh, she was in old age in the 1970s, most people weren't really thinking or talking um, about her. So that began to be rectified about four years after her death. So the Museum of Modern Art did a major exhibition, her first major exhibition, four years after her death in February of 1980. And I'm showing you some of the installation views, which give you just another glimpse at the breadth of her designs from screens and uh, room dividing screens to rugs, to tapestries, to furniture. 33 years later, the, uh, the Pompidou Center in her adopted uh, hometown of Paris uh, did an even larger retrospective. And I'm showing you an installation view from that here. And at this point in time, historians were pointing out that her, the appreciation for Gray in the late 20th century was really 
had really been separated into kind of two buckets. People knew her in within the decorative arts. So they knew about her lacquer furnishings um, and her rugs and tapestries, or they knew about her as an architect um, for the, you know, the structures that she designed and built. And so this, this installation really emphasized the unbroken whole of her work, everything that she had done. And I think in the years since, um, her work has been appreciated in that context of being a total work of art. So here is um, an homage to Gray on the right-hand side that was part of a major exhibition at MoMA in 2013, 2014 called Designing Modern Women. You can see, um, you can see the light, um, the, the vertical light that Alyssa showed you last week, one of her signature black screens, that adjustable table that I just showed you here on, on the right. So most recently, and this one kind of breaks my heart because um, this was an incredible exhibition that was organized by, um, by the Bard Graduate Center in New York and had the great misfortune to open um, in the pandemic. And so, um, as I mentioned, a lot of Gray's furnishings were unique because they were made as part of a total interior. So her work is actually quite rare and hard to come by. Much of it is in European museums or private collections. So it is it is no small thing to um, to reassemble her work. And so this was this was to have been the the kind of great moment when all this work came back to the States uh, for American audiences to see. And in fact, very few people were able to see it, myself included, uh, because, of, because of COVID. So I'm gonna show you the next couple of slides are installation views from the Bard Graduate Center. And they did a really beautiful job of, um, they did a really beautiful job of showing a, a large photo blow up of the interior and then gathering in front of it furnishings that were in that space. So this is um, from a room she designed in 1923. And um, Paris, Paris had a, um, was particularly supportive of decorative artists and architects in this period in the 1920s and 1930s. And there were biannual um, salons in the spring and in the fall in which people could showcase furniture, they could showcase entire rooms. And so Gray was one of many, um, many artists and that, that exhibited in these, in these salons. So this room that she designed um, was presented in, um, in the 14th annual salon um, of the Society of Artist Decorators in the Grand Palais in Paris. And this was called a bedroom or boudoir for Monte Carlo. And so you can see everything that she designed here included this block screen or brick screen, which is one of her signature pieces, a lacquer desk in the middle, a bench, rugs, lamp, um, and as well as a small table. And here's just a detail of these screens. So most of the time, I don't know how many of these there are, maybe maybe a couple dozen. Um, you know, they were they were one of her favorite. Uh, one of her favorite and signature forms, but they were, you know, they were expensive and complicated. And um, so not that many survive to this day. So you can see here, this one from the bedroom boudoir for Monte Carlo is painted white. Most of the time they were lacquer, which makes them very shiny and very hard. And this one had a much softer surface with this matte white paint. And the other thing I like about this view is you can see what it looks like when it's closed up too. And so it's actually a quite, it has an actual, a quite beautiful architectural presence um, when it's closed as well. So probably Gray's best known, most famous example of, of built architecture was a vacation house called E1027 that she designed in collaboration with the Romanian French architect, Jean Badovici. And this was in the South of France overlooking the Mediterranean Sea. So again, you can see an interior view in the back it, as it was installed in the Bard Graduate Center last year, and then these incredible furnishings arrayed in front. And so um, this room, the, or this, this architecture really showcased, uh, this architecture and the furnishings for it 
showcased uh, Gray's investment in modes of modern living, where there are large, large rooms, large open spaces, and where the furnishings themselves start, start to divide the space and, you, and, and set up different zones of use within a large room. So you can see um, in the middle of the illustration, there's a large kind of divan. Um, so that's a lounging piece of furniture that's in the middle of the room. And um, I'll show you in detail a few of the other things. So this just gives you an, a sense of the range of her work, her beautiful choices of materials, again, the combination of kind of luxurious and very natural. So this is a mobile dressing table. So you can see the way that the steel makes a little handle on the left. So this wouldn't be terribly heavy. Um, so you could move this. I don't think you move it daily, right? But it's not a fixed <laughs> built in. You could, you could take this somewhere else in the house um, or somewhere else in the room. And so it has this beautiful lacquered top and then um, these more natural drawers that kind of um, swing out and then this really beautiful chromed tubular steel frame. Some additional metal furnishings and particularly I'd point out this dressing cabinet on the left. So this takes, this takes Gray's interest in screens and room dividers and kind of encloses it and makes it into a cabinet. So this is able to contain things, but it also can perform that partitioning function within the interior. So she made three different versions of this cabinet. Again, talking about the, the custom nature and the rarity of her work. She made three versions of this between 1926 and 1932. And this was the first one. Um, for the Vacation House E1027. Um, and the second one was for her private residence, which we'll see in just a minute. And the third one was for her collaborator, Jean Badavici's own studio apartment in Paris. Um, but this is really wonderful in that it uses aluminum. Um, so it's quite modern aluminum and then um, combined with the beautiful wood inside. So here are two additional pieces of seating furniture that, um, that Gray designed. On the left, this is called her transept armchair. And she made this form a number of different times with slight variations. This one was made particularly for the, um, the Mediterranean air. And the upholstery is a, a coated canvas that was meant to be able to withstand the salt air and the rain so that this could be used in the living room or out on the terrace. And then the chair on the right is one of my favorites, not just uh, for its very avant-garde form, but also for its title. This is called the nonconformist chair. <laughs> And this is unique. This is the one and only that she made. And she talked about how this asymmetrical design with the one armrest was set up so that you could, you could prop yourself up on it. You could put one arm on the armrest and smoke while crossing your legs and kind of leaning into conversation with somebody on the open side. So this is a, a flexible piece of furniture that is, um, very much reflecting the, the, um, the culture and the type of activity that the designer envisions taking place in the space. So here's the last uh, interior of Gray's that we're going to look at. This is also from the Bard Graduate Show. So this is Tompe, Tompe Apaya, which Eileen Gray designed for herself. So this was her house in, um, in the, south, in the south of France, also overlooking the Mediterranean. And she built this on top of some existing structures that were into the hillside. So it's basically a terrace of three levels that uses, um, makes use of a lot of indoor and outdoor space. So a few pieces of furniture from this house, uh, this coffee table, which I think is quite striking in, in several ways. One, this bent, um, you know, kind of hairpin leg, which we start to see uh, increasingly in modern furniture in, in made both in Europe and America in the 1920s and 30s and, and 40s and 50s and beyond. But um, this kind of manipulation of metal into organic shapes becomes quite popular for furniture bases, whether those are chairs or tables. Um, but then the top of this too, in this 
big organic amoeba-like shape that almost looks like a painter's palette. Um, and this really contrasts with the shiny high finish metal. You can see that the wood is barely sealed. It's very naturalistic and in fact has a really strong grain. Um, so you can kind of imagine how this would feel, um, you know, even a little bit, um, a little bit rough if you put your hands over it. And she's also carved into the surface um, a design that echoes the abstract pattern of the tabletop itself. And a final piece of furniture from um, Tompe Apaya. This is a metal chair that Gray designed for the patio or for the terrace at the house. It's made of painted metal and canvas. And um, apparently she was quite fond of this chair because when she ultimately sold her house in the south of France and um, moved exclusively back into her apartment in Paris in old age, she took this chair with her. So this is one of the last known photos on the right of Eileen Gray and uh, in the 1970s. And she's sitting in that, in, in this, um, what I would imagine would be somewhat uncomfortable um, uh, terrace chair that's literally just canvas stretched over um, a, a metal frame, but in her living room with again, her signature screen behind her. All right, so next up, another French woman, although um, Charlotte Perriand was born French, whereas Eileen Gray adopted the country as her home. Uh, I'd also like to look at Perriand in depth. Both of these women were extremely uh, prolific and influential uh, in, in their fields. So Charlotte Perriand uh, grew up in Paris. She studied arts and design. She was quite a skilled student. And um, in 1925, she was still a student and she exhibited, um, she exhibited three works in the Exposition d'Art Décoratif, the modern World's Fair that was in Paris that year. And then soon after she began exhibiting designs in Paris's seasonal salons that I mentioned with Eileen Gray. So this is a, a young student coming up and taking advantage of these opportunities. And I'll say just briefly, we'll, we'll hear more about this chaise, which is one of her most famous designs in a bit, but this one is in the Carnegie Museum of Arts collection and it is on view in Extraordinary Ordinary Things. If you are local and are able to come in, um, do take a look at this incredible object. So um, as a young graduate and budding designer, Perriand paid a visit sometime in early 1927 to the famous architect Le Corbusier, which means the raven. Um, sometimes I feel like we don't talk about how weird this, how weird this is, right? Like this, um, he's such a lion of modernist architecture. Um, his name was Charles Edouard Jean um, but he went by the raven. So he has this singular moniker. Um, and I just think it's um, certainly notable in terms of, in terms of his idea of his own importance that he goes by this, this one word phrase. So anyway, um, the young Perriand pops into Le Corbusier's uh, studio in 1927 seeking employment. And he infamously told her in a very dismissive way, um, we don't embroider cushions here. And so she left. Uh, and Ironically, she would be back and he would relent and hire her because uh, he was in fact seeking a furniture designer. Uh, by this point in time, Corbusier's architecture was turning heads. Uh, he famously called buildings um, machines for living. And on the right, this is his pavilion um, of the new spirit uh, at the Paris Exposition in 1924, 25. So again, the same place where Perriand, as a young student, showed three works. Le Corbusier had designed this entire modern um, residence that was displayed and was highly influential in launching international style architecture. So this is, um, these are structures made often of concrete and glass and metal with open floor plans, um, very, very um, big departure from the past architecturally. 
That said, um, for all the impact of the architecture, Corbusier's furnishings of the space were relatively lackluster. So it's, it's really the room that's striking here, not the furniture. So this is the interior of that same building. And you can see he has some kind of nondescript club chairs and even uh, the off the shelf tonic cafe chairs. Um, you can see them on either side of the table on the right and just um, being cropped out of the screen on the left. So here's this man uh, who is creating some of the most avant-garde architecture in the world. And he's using a chair design from the last century. That's a, you know, off the shelf solution. So he had been criticized for this. He was seeking help um, to hire somebody in furniture design, but obviously he didn't initially imagine that this would be a young woman. Meanwhile, Perriand exhibited um, her own head turning interior. This was called the bar under the roof. Um, on the left, a sketch, and on the right, a photograph of the installation in the, in the flesh. And so this was exhibited at the Autumn Salon in Paris in 1927 with furnishings of her, uh, of her own design. And this was uh, received to great acclaim. She actually talked about um, how shocking it was all of a sudden to be known um, and to have, um, you know, have, have a, a flashbulb of a camera going off and um, people wanting to talk to her. So she, she was actually skyrocketing to early success. Uh, around the same time, she was also designing furniture for her own apartment. So um, this was an apartment that she, she was moving into with um, her English husband, Percy Schofield. And so she designed this really beautiful and successful swivel armchair in 1927. And um, there were, as designers across Europe experimented with tubular steel, um, many of them were trying to figure out the circle and, and how to have a kind of circular seat. And this is largely considered to be one of the most successful in terms of the way it was constructed and also the, also the form. So on the right, a drawing that she did of the interior and on the left, the swivel armchair. So it's important to note, she designed this chair before she worked for Cabousier. Um, later, this would be produced um, under her name as well as Corbusier's and Pierre Jean Ray, her, her new collaborators. Um, so the authorship of this um, gets a little bit fuzzy with the, the, two, the two men getting to actually kind of tag along on a piece of furniture that she designed before she even worked for them. Um, nonetheless, she was hired by Corbusier before the end of the year and, um, and came into the studio to undertake the furnishings for his his stark architectural program and in time uh, he would he would credit her her great skill um, she had a knack he and others felt for for furnishing the modern interior so she knew how to use furniture to break up these large undifferentiated spaces so she just kind of had her her finger on the pulse of the furnishings that worked with these architecture with this new style of architecture so she was quite brilliant in this space so on the upper left hand side you can see a couple of sketches that uh like Corbusier had done suggesting different postures and this was as far as he had taken the furniture project when she was hired and on the right, you can see her taking this further with these wireframe chair mock-ups and a little mannequin. And if you look at the, the photographs of the mannequin and you look on the upper right-hand corner, you will see the shape of the famous chaise longue that, uh, that she conceived. And on the bottom left, you can see the patent drawing that Perriand herself filed for the design um, and there's three names on the patent, hers first, as well as Le Corbusier and Pierre Jeanneret, who was his cousin um, and collaborator as well. So I do think it's telling, like, telling that uh, her name is first on the patent. Um, it is worth noting though, over time as, um, as design historians and, and all of us um, who are just design lovers, 
reach for a kind of shorthand, people will call the chaise the Le Corbusier chaise. And um, I would really argue that if we were to pick one name, we should call it Perion's chaise, not Le Corbusier's. So uh, the pressure was really on when she joined the staff. Uh, the plan was to exhibit um, an entirely new space and furnishings for the Autumn Salon in 1927. So a little less than two years later, and they had to figure out the whole, this, this whole um, uh, res basically residence and, um, and all of the furnishings within. And so it was really Perion who launched into the furnishings, really everything you see here from the partitions that divide up this large room. And you, know, you can tell the space on the left is a large living room with areas for dining, a desk, as well as lounging. The, um, the, the overhead um, partition and then the cabinetry on the right kind of replaces a wall. So um, this separates the, um, the service spaces from the living spaces. And so you can just see peeking out this cylinder right here, that's the shower. Um, so you, obviously you can't see the person who's actually bathing, but you can see the top of the shower. So the bathroom is back here. The kitchen is over here as well um, as, our, um, as our bedrooms. And so picking up again on um, Le Corbusier's famous phrase, a machine for living, this is the interior equipment for a home. You know, if, if the home is the machine, this is the equipment to make it run. And this was uh, an extremely influential uh, display that, um, that really defined um, ways of, of modern living. You can see in the foreground, um, Perion's swivel chair, in, right in the middle of the photo, her chaise lounge, uh, and, and several other pieces of furniture that would really come to define her legacy. So she did not work forever uh, for Le Corbusier. She collaborated, in fact, with many artists. She became dear friends with um, the, the painter and sculptor, Fernand Legere, and um, they collaborated together on this interior called House for a Young Man uh, that was exhibited at the um, Universal Exhibition in Brussels in 1935. And um, she also was, um, she was an avid skier and she was, she became increasingly interested in the idea of prefab architecture for, le uh, for leisure. And so uh, in the 1930s, she designed a number of different um, modular structures that could be assembled um, basically in, in the woods. So this is a design um, based on a high mountain shelter. So she, the, the, I forget how many sides it is. I think it's, I think it's 10, it's a 10 or 12 sided structure. Um, but this was originally inspired the shape from a merry-go-round that she'd seen in Croatia. And her largest version of this design was a mountain shelter that could um, hold up to 38 people. And the idea was that um, no single component you know, weighed more than someone could carry. And so you could hike up into the mountains with a team of people and assemble this. So like I said, this was a concept in the 30s never built um, in the ensuing war years. And then um, other projects took, um, you know, took up her time afterward. Um, but in 2010, one of these was actually built. So this is an eight person version. And um, I got to see this, I took the picture on the right. Um, I got to see this in a major Perion retrospective that was at the, um, the Louis Vuitton Foundation in Paris in 2019 and early 2020. And so this is um, this absolutely incredible little structure. And I'll show you another some other pictures inside. So you can see on the left, a bucket that you could carry outside and fill with water and the way that it's hanging with a little spigot, it becomes a sink. There's a small little hot plate on the counter in the corner. There's a stove in the middle that goes up a central chimney that you can both cook on and, and also use for heat. There are these little um, triangular tables that fit neatly up against 
one of the facets of this polygonal <laughs> structure, but you can also take the triangular tables out from the wall and um, arrange them one, uh, one next to the other to make a longer table. So on the right hand side, you can see these folding berths to sleep in. So these are, these are bunks, but if you fold up this bunk, this becomes a bench where you can sit and set up those tables to have um, a dining table. Um, and of course, if you, the table's in your way, if the bench is in your way too, you can also be hooked up with straps. And then this little ladder goes to an upper level that has um, bunks for additional people. All right, one more project of Perion's that I would like to show you. If you've been to the museum, you might recognize this piece of furniture as well. This is the Bibliothèque Mexique, um, the Mexican bookshelf. Perion was engaged in uh, the early 1950s to design um, the furniture and fittings for two sets of dormitories at the City University in Paris. And so she came up with these beautiful modular bookcases. Uh, and so this combines painted metal with again a soft very natural wood um, in this case kind of like a pine and um, a number of the different colorful metal panels slide so you can change um, the amount of opacity and you can also define these compartments as being open the whole way through or opening to one side versus opening to the other side. So it's a very flexible piece of furniture as well as a room divider. And you can see how this was, um, how this was intended to be set up. This is a recreation of one of the dormitories from the exhibition in Paris in, in uh, 2019. And so um, at the back, you can see the doorway into the space. And so this is kind of a fixed wardrobe. And, um, and back here, there is a small kind of dining space. And then this bookshelf is your partition, again, separating the kind of serving area from the living area. Uh, she, was designed, she was hired to do two different dorms, um, the Tunisian dorm and the Mexican dorm. And so um, this is a slight variation um, for the, um, the Tunisian dormitory. And here's a, a period picture too, where we can see um, a young man in the room. So again, both uh, or two fantastic objects by Periand are on view in Extraordinary Ordinary Things. So I would encourage you to come take a look. All right, jumping over to the United States and to Ray Eames, who uh, we met briefly in some previous classes. Um, Unlike the, um, the previous two figures, um, Periand and Gray, who either um, eschewed marriage or um, were, were with individuals who were not practicing in the same field um, and really continued to work quite independently, Ray Eames was, of course, married to Charles Eames and so fought a, a lifelong and career long um, battle for recognition. Although maybe that's not the best word because she didn't really fight for it. Um, she accepted her role and I mean, accepted the role that the public wanted her to, to take. And um, both Charles and Ray in interviews were very committed to, um, to the fact that all of their work was a true collaboration and everything was, you know, 50, 50, 60, 40, um, they, they couldn't even separate whose was whose because everything was, was deeply synthetically collaborative. Um, and together they really revolutionized public awareness of modern design in, um, in the United States in the middle of the 20th century. Um, they really fought to dispel the belief that modern design was cold or uninviting, and they brought a sense of warmth and play uh, and informality to modern interiors. So a little bit about Ray. She was born in Sacramento, California. Her name was actually, um, her given name was Bernice Alexandra and um, Bernice Alexandra Kaiser. And Ray was a childhood nickname that just ended up sticking. <laughs> And uh, so she went by Ray uh, for most of her life. So she was very interested in art and design at an early age. 
uh, and studied in, um, in many different media. She was particularly a particularly talented painter and she went to New York City and studied with Hans Hoffman. You can see on the left, um, one of the few surviving um, prints from this time period. So she, she was particularly interested in abstraction and um, a lot of her paintings featured um, abstract biomorphic forms and um, a really bold use of space. And I think it, it, isn't, it isn't much of a leap to look at the print on the left and see how her aesthetic um, came to bear in a lot of their collaborative furnishings together. You can see again in this picture of her on the left, you know, this shape that she's holding. Um, and in a lot of ways, their organic furnishings picked up on her sense of um, sense of line and shape and composition as a painter. So in the, in the late 1930s, uh, Ray was leaving New York. Um, her mother was ill and she was thinking about going back to California. And one of her friends um, encouraged her to continue her studies and go to the Cranbrook Academy of Art in Michigan, which ended up being a, um, a very influential step because that's where she met. Charles. And Charles was actually a little bit older than her, about seven, eight years older than her. And um, so he was a teacher and, um, and she was a student. And um, so they, they met each other there and were quite, um, quite taken with each other creatively. Um, they, they saw um, a wonderful kind of synthesis of their talents. He was, he was actually in another relationship. Um, uh, but they stayed in touch. Ray went back to California after graduation and Charles ultimately divorced and moved out to California. And um, he and Ray were married and the rest, as they say, is history. So some of their early work together um, had <laughs> involved the leg splint, which is on the right hand side. So they built a machine, which you can see in the upper center called, um, they called the Kazam machine. And this was a vacuum forming device for shaping um, plywood into organic three-dimensional curves. And, you know, again, to unpack just a little that idea of a collaborative relationship, um, it was actually Ray who was in the apartment with the, the time to, to figure out the nuances of this DIY machine that they had created. Um, because Charles um, uh, had a, had a job and was paying the you know had a had a day job and was paying the bills, um, but it was actually Ray who was spending a lot of time at home fussing with this. Um, nonetheless, when the furniture was exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art, when the furniture was put into production by Herman Miller, um, it was marketed as furniture by Charles Eames, and um, so. He was resolute in naming her as an equal collaborator. Um, he famously said, you know, whatever I can do, Ray can do better. Uh, but I think the country and the culture just continually inclined toward him as the spokesperson and Ray as the helpful assistant or the, the great woman behind the man. Uh, and she didn't really... She didn't really fight this role. Um, she said in interviews that it was just people wanted to hear, the public wanted to hear from Charles. When he spoke, they listened. She felt when she spoke, they didn't. And so um, she, she, she tacitly accepted this role, even though their work was, a, was truly collaborative. So among their most famous designs are the Eames storage units. These were um, modular pieces of furniture that were inspired by industrial shelving and they could be assembled very inexpensively and um, could adapt to all sorts of circumstances. And you can see here the, um, the ESU, the Eames storage unit on view at, um, at CMOA. Ray in an interview late in her life with the design historian Pat Kirkham um, actually discouraged design historians from trying to pick out contributions that were uniquely hers versus her husband's um, because it was all a collaboration. And if, if we say that such and such a stool 
was rays, um, then that just simply suggests that another object where we don't draw that line isn't. And so she really preferred that everything just be credited to the two of them. Uh, she also brilliantly um, embodied and promoted ideas of, of modern entertaining um, and the modern home. And so they were actually frequently uh, hosts in the home that they designed for themselves outside of Los Angeles. So um, I think there was actually quite a lot that Ray was consciously constructing in, in, terms, of her, in terms of her role. All right, another figure that we have also heard about again, uh, heard about previously is the Hungarian American designer, Eva Zeisel, uh, who had an impressively long career. She lived to the age of 105. And we heard about her in our second session on ceramics. And in fact, she was prolific in this space. She designed ceramics for industry and quite a lot of them over probably seven decades. Lesser known is some of her work in other media. And she designed a, a really fabulous and now quite rare chair in the late 1940s. So the chair used, um, again, bent tubular steel. We keep seeing that material. It was very new and very exciting to designers in this period. And so here we see Zeisel with various models uh, on, various models on the left for, um, made out of wire for different chairs. I think the one in her hand is more or less the one that was produced. And so here is a prototype of the chair. This is in the Hagley Museum collection in, um, in Northern Delaware. And then here, a chair in the Museum of Modern Arts collection. The picture on the right shows you what's actually original. Uh, the picture on the left is modern upholstery to show um, how it was intended to function. But the original upholstery to this is lost. But I think it's just such a gorgeous organic form, even without the upholstery, it's like a sculpture. Yet another familiar face is Greta Magnuson Grossman. Uh, Greta um, had a also a prolific career on two continents. She was born in Sweden. And um, <clears throat> although we heard about her last week in the context of lighting, she uh, actually completed a one-year woodworking apprenticeship in her native Sweden, in her hometown of Helsingborg. And um, based on that was awarded a scholarship to, um, to study at uh, Konstvok, the Stockholm's major art school. So there she really mastered technical drawing and worked in furniture, textiles, and ceramics. Uh, in 1933, she actually received a, a second place award for one of her furniture designs from the Stockholm Craft Association. And she was the first woman to ever receive an award in that category. So she had a studio briefly in Stockholm. And then in, 19, uh, then in, in 1933, she married the American jazz band leader, Billy Grossman, and, um, and moved with him to the United States in 1940 and settled in LA. So she quickly created um, a much publicized shop in Beverly Hills that um, build and on her her business cards build her as a Swedish uh, Swedish modern designer of furniture rugs lamps and other home furnishings. She actually had a lot of celebrity clients, people like Greta Garbo, Joan Fontaine, and Gracie Allen, um, notably um, women celebrities um, patronizing this woman designer. So here are a few of her more famous designs. Uh, this wonderful desk. Um, notice, notice the little ball feet. This was a motif, these circles. Um, you can see it on the knob of the desk, but also on the front feet. In the photo on the right, you can see this desk, one of these desks in situ. This was produced by a furniture company called Glen of California. Uh, and look in the, the left-hand side of the black and white photograph, you can see a room divider screen that we'll see again in a little bit more detail 
that again uses those um, uses those little round wooden balls. Uh, so here are some other famous furniture designs: the Palomino lounge chair um, that she designed for a company called Barker Brothers, and uh, then on the right, a coffee table, uh, almost like an ironing board with the way that it's uh, supported on this sculptural brass base. And in fact, it's often referred to today as her ironing board table because the, um, the, the shape and the association is so, um, is so strong. On the left, a chaise she designed uh, in the late 1940s and then a wonderful coffee table that has these three separate almost floating circles on top of little circular ball feet. And then finally from Greta, this incredible uh, room divider screen on the right, there are these taut wires that hold yellow, blue, and red balls at various interviews. So of course this doesn't, um, this doesn't really block the space visually um, very much. Uh, so it both divides a room while also keeping it very open and um, you know, allowing light and also sight lines to penetrate. And these are quite, these are quite rare today. I think there's only about three of them uh, of the screens, the where where the, the whereabouts are known. All right, we have looked at a lot of um, looked at a lot of modern looked at a lot of modern designers um, whose, work, um, whose work is very streamlined. Um, Gabriella Crespi is a, was a Milanese designer from um, Italy. Uh, she worked in Milan and um, she combined um, kind of stark metals and travertine marble with rattan and a kind of bohemian chic. So she was, um, she really got her big break after attending architecture school and designing objects for her friend, for her friends um, who were fairly well off. She was from, um, she was from uh, an affluent family in Milan. And Dior asked, noticing some of the furnishings, Dior asked, if they could carry her goods in their store in Paris. And so um, that was really the launch of her career. And, and she was particularly well known in the 70s. So this is her, um, here you can see on the right, two of her famous coffee tables um, with these kind of protruding slabs that can slide in or out and allow a certain amount of flexibility to the furniture almost like a, like a mesa or a plateau. And on the left, this interior, I think really shows how she combined this with plants, with soft textures um, in ways that were a bit more kind of boho chic. Here again, um, this kind of stark contrast from her, her Z-shaped desk, which you can actually see here in a different finish. The Z-shaped desk was one of her signature pieces. And then on the right, this much more organic, organic um, tiered occasional table made out of rattan. So jumping up north um, to a Dane, this is Greta Yolk. And um, she contributed significantly to Denmark's reputation for modern furniture. She was also, um, in addition to being a designer, she was a major writer and publisher. So she edited uh, a Danish magazine called Mobilia uh, Furniture and um, also put together a four volume work on the history of Danish furniture. So she had quite a passion for design history and for design publishing as well. So she was born in Copenhagen and um, after graduating high school, she studied at, the, at a, um, what was called the Design School for Women under a woman cabinet maker, Karen Margareta Conradson. Um, and she ended up um, taking part in, um, a, in a number of annual competitions that helped showcase her work. And she also taught at the design school later on. So she was really, she was really inspired by the work of the Eameses, 
um, and also by um, fellow Scandinavian Alvar Alto in their use of pen, bent plywood and um, organic forms. So this became an impo a particularly important part of our, her repertoire. So you can see her with some scale models of these furnishings on the bottom right, and then some of her furniture in the flesh. Uh, I love these, these stacking, these nesting tables in this kind of um, this great shape. Probably her single most famous design is this chair. Only about 300 of them were produced in the 1960s uh, because they're actually, um, they're deceptively complicated. If you look closely, you can see that this whole chair is made out of two pieces of plywood that are bolted together at the back. But those two pieces of plywood have an extremely complex shape. So, um, you know, when you make something like this, there's a fold, there's a, a mold or a form that the plywood has to get wrapped over, um, compressed under pressure, glued, and then trimmed to the, the final profile. So these were not, um, not easy to make, but they're quite, quite beautiful, really elegant in that simplicity of design that also, I think even more so than, um, more than the Eames's furniture, which tends to be more like potato chip shapes. Um, the, the curves of these are so deep as to almost suggest folded paper. So they have a bit more of um, almost a uh, origami type feeling. So this is Lena Bobardi. Some of you may have seen a couple of years ago, we had a wonderful show in the Heinz Architectural Center at the Carnegie. Um, Lena Bobardi draws and the, um, the beautiful illustration that I'm showing in the bottom half of the screen was from that show. So Lena was born as Aquilina Bo in, um, uh, in Italy in 1914. And um, she spent most of her working life in, um, in Brazil. And she was really interested in the, the social and cultural potential of architecture and design. So really in its ability to impact, um, impact people and a sense of uh, community. So she did struggle um, doubly as both a woman and a foreigner in Brazil to, um, to really gain recognition um, and here are, here are a couple of her designs. The one on the left is probably her most famous. This is called the bowl chair, which was designed um, particularly with um, relationship to the proportions of the human body in mind. So it has this four-legged metal frame and then a semispherical seat that can, can change its angle on the frame so that you can be more upright or more reclining. And uh, in 1953, this chair was on the cover of the US magazine Interiors and Lena herself was sitting in the chair. Um, and, and it was described as womb-like, as a womb-like cuddle bowl, um, which I think um, is both quite feminine, but also emphasizing the, the human, um, the, the humanness, the intended kind of humanity of this design and its relationship to the body. All right. Our next figure is, um, is still alive as we move forward in time. This is Mira Nakashima. And um, if you have heard of Nakashima, you have probably heard of her father's work. Um, she has a kind of uniquely challenging path um, she was born in 1942. She um, studied at Harvard and then um, studied architecture at Harvard and also has a master's degree in architecture from Waseda University in Tokyo. And she came back after graduate school and worked with her father, who by that point in time was a famous um, American studio furniture maker. And um, she worked with him until his death in 1990. And when he died, there was such a myth, um, kind of myth of male genius, myth of the singular craftsman um, doing everything himself that the studio almost folded because um, 
everything had been built up around the kind of singular genius of her father. In fact, she had been working with him for decades um, and um, had many designs of her own. And so she is a, an extremely talented woman furniture designer who has had to fight both to save the family company, but also um, for any recognition outside of her father's work. And I still, um, I've gotten to work with her on a couple of different projects and I still, I still feel for her because in some ways um, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Her father's fame uh, gave her a platform and this incredible company to lead. And on the other hand, the world has never really wanted to see, I think, what Mira might do that is, um, that is very different from her father's work. So I'm going to give myself a break from talking and all of you a little break from hearing me talk. And um, we will look at a um, look at a film, a brief interview with um, with Mira and her and her dad. So give me just a second to get this up properly. Okay. Melissa, can we see and hear? Can. There's a spirit in trees that's very deep and in order to produce a fine piece of furniture, the spirit of a tree lives on. And I can give it a second life because I can make an object that lives and can live forever, possibly. Dad really believed that there are spirits in the wood that enhance people's lives. and. You know, not everybody can live in the woods, but they can live with wood and stay connected to nature and to the divine in that way. George Nakashima is one of the formative designers of the 20th century. He was influenced by traditional Japanese design, by American shaker design and country design. So there are influences, but he took these things and combined them in a way that nobody had ever done before. Maybe 10, huh? Yeah, maybe. Well, I guess my dad was my primary mentor, although when I grew up with him, I didn't think he was anything but dad or that he was doing anything unusual that dads didn't do. <laughs> I was born in Spokane, Washington. I've lived almost every place else such as France and Japan, and then India. His first training at University of Washington was in forestry, and after two years, he switched to architecture. In 1940, my father made up his mind that he would do furniture because he could control the process from the beginning to the end. To this day, it's probably a little more control than we need to have, because we actually go out and look at trees. These are all ours? Yeah, these are all your trees. I'm looking forward to cutting them, sort of. <laughs> we actually decide right on site how we're going to cut them. You know, it's amazing, because you never know what's going to be inside there until you get there. Dad used to take me along to the lumber yard, and he'd say, well, when you cut a tree, it's like cutting diamonds and we'll cut it this way because the grain's more beautiful that way. Wow! Oh, wow, look at that. Beautiful. I was in Tokyo, and I met a young lady there. And we returned to this country, and we became married. And then uh, war broke out. Pearl Harbor. And one of the results was that we were put into concentration camps, about which most Americans didn't know anything.
in the camp, Dad would teach this fellow woodworker how to design things, and the fellow would teach him how to make things. So they developed inventive ways of using the old army cots and scrap materials. I still have the toy box that he made for me when I was in camp. Coming down. Go for it. Art has to be beautiful. Craft implies, in my father's definition, that it should be something that's practical and useful in life. When Dad first had his show at the American Craft Museum, it was the first time it was exhibited as if it were works of art. Up until then, it had just been furniture. George is really identified with the concept of the naturalistic top laid on top of a very architectural base. It's both natural and man-made simultaneously. Yeah, I worked with George for uh, 17 years or so. One of the uh, approaches that George took was looking for the soul of the tree. It means that the woodworker has to not impose his own thoughts on the tree. The tree is given a chance to come forth with its story, and in that dialogue, conveys something to the woodworker. I was pretty much the understudy. He never told me the way to do things, he would just change a line. He wouldn't tell me why he changed the line. And I can't count the number of times I was fired <laughs> while Ted was alive. It was very good discipline. <laughs> In 1984, he came across an enormous walnut log, and he had this dream to make peace altars for each of the continents of the world. Yeah, that's good. Pretty flat. No twist. No twist. He thought if people had an altar where they could resolve their differences, that we would be that much closer to world peace. He made the first altar, which was installed at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in 1986. He was trying to negotiate sending a peace altar to Russia when he passed away in 1990. The reason we built this shed is that when Dad passed away, there was a huge stack of lumber sitting out in the rain, and we had nowhere to put it. Nice smaller board from that. So I thought momentarily of maybe selling it at that point. Pretty. And then we thought, well, you know, that's Dad's last legacy. Yeah, that'd be nice. That's a nice color for me. After the uh, log is cut, it has to air dry for at least a year to two years just to stabilize itself. Once they're dried, uh, select them for each particular job that we do. And it's, it's a long process. Mira Nakashima is really the only true heir to the Nakashima legacy. Mira is now functioning in exactly the same way that George did, making decisions about how to cut the board. Get rid of those corners a little bit. Where to put the legs, where to put the butterflies. She's the only person who is designing in the Nakashima style. Her work is somewhat different than her father's work. What that means, really, is the pieces that are coming out of the studio today are Mira Nakashima pieces. I just sort of picked up the pieces where Dad let them fall and have tried to continue his tradition and explore it a little further. In India, they believe that beauty is is man's connection to the divine. Dad's whole operation here has been, he called it his karma yoga, his way of being, which is a form of meditation. Some people get it, some people don't. But I hope that that tradition can continue somehow because it's very meaningful, it's very important in our world today. 
And if we end up with something that pleases us and, and pleases others, uh, we feel that the destiny of a piece of wood has been fulfilled. I do encourage anyone, if you're ever in the eastern part of the state, uh, the Nakashima studio is in New Hope, Pennsylvania. It's now a... Um, a national historic landmark, and you can sign up and go uh, go on tours, which is really really remarkable. Um, all right, so here were just a few of the additional pieces of furniture coming out of the uh, out of the studio today. All right, um, so moving on to Denise Scott Brown, um, who is also still with us. Um, she is an architect. Uh, an, a, a city planner, a writer, an educator, and a principal of the firm Venturi Scott Brown and Associates in Philadelphia. So she was famously in partnership with her husband, Robert Venturi, who died several years ago. And together, they, um, they were among the most influential architects in the 20th century. And I think one of the things one of the things that they are most known for, and that really comes uh, initially from Janice Scott Brown's work in graduate school, uh, is for a very severe critique of modernity. So we have seen a lot of modern furniture today. And um, Denise Scott Brown was um, fascinated by the city of Las Vegas, of all the lights, of all the pastiche, of all the facades. Um, and was critical of the way that um, that modern design so that modernism in architecture and design so um, so completely and abruptly kind of canceled out context and history, right? So if we look back at um, Le Corbusier's uh, concrete and and, st and steel and glass box of architecture. Um, it's very dismissed from history. It's dismissed from context or place. That box could be anywhere. And um, so Denise Scott Brown really wanted to bring, um, bring back a sense of play, bring back elements of, um, of history, also of even of kitsch and whimsy and critique. And so her project, um, as a university student, you're seeing photographs that she took here in Las Vegas that are part of Carnegie Museum of Arts collection. Um, this project turned into a legendary book, which is called Learning from Las Vegas, which um, was really a book about architectural theory. So when she, um, when she married Robert Venturi in 1967, she was already an architect. She was already a respected assistant professor with a following of students. Uh, she was published and um, she realized when, as soon as she married Venturi, everything changed. The, um, the respect and autonomy that she was granted as a single woman, as a professor and um, an architect, just disappeared and was eclipsed by her husband. And so I'm, I'm going to just read you a, a quick quote um, from an essay that she wrote in 1989. Uh, the essay was called Room at the Top, Question Mark, Sexism and the Star System in Architecture. And again, this relates to the story that we just heard um, about Mira Nakashima, the way that we have 10 or, or even Le Corbusier and, um, and Charlotte Perriand, the way that we have tended to recognize stars and how those stars are often white males uh, and how in doing so we erase the people that worked with them sometimes uh, who, who were often as significant, um, if not more so in their contributions. So this is what um, Denise Scott Brown wrote in 1989. She said there would be celebratory dinners where she was left out because quote unquote, we weren't inviting the wives job interviews where she was excluded because the presence of quote, the architect's wife would distress the board or countless meetings that began, so you're the architect to Venturi followed by, oh, and you're an architect too? 
um, to, to Scott Brown. Uh, and then of course, to crown it all in 1991, when the Pritzker Prize jury, the most um, significant and famous um, or prestigious award in architecture, when the Pritzker Prize jury awarded, um, awarded the prize in 1991, to their body of work that had, quote, expanded and redefined the limits of art and architecture in this century as perhaps no other has, the award was given to Venturi alone. Um, and this, she actually um, did not attend the um, presentation of, a, of the award to her husband in protest. Uh, and years later in 2013, um, a number of women architects uh, and, and female architecture students began a petition that ultimately got tens of thousands of signatures um, lobbying Pritzker to go back and add Denise Scott Brown to the prize, which they refused to do, um, saying that they couldn't retroactively change the decision of a jury. So um, perhaps one of the more public and egregious exclusions of a very significant woman in design. So um, the two collaborated, as I said, on countless works of architecture. Um, this series of furniture is perhaps their most famous uh, in terms of furniture. So uh, I mentioned the, um, the critique of erasing history in modernism. And so they did a whole line of chairs that actually quite playfully takes the silhouettes of historic styles, whether that's Chippendale or Queen Anne or neoclassical, and um, makes these molded plywood and laminate chairs um, that kind of ape the silhouettes. And so here, <laughs> um, uh, Denise Scott Brown is wearing the quote unquote grandmother dress. And this is in a, um, a, a pattern that she designed, the graphics um, that is also on the chair that is, um, is to her left. So this is a very tongue in cheek pose um, by her here, but um, something about the way that he is positioned behind her is also just very ominous. Um, and so there's, there's a lot that can be read into um, into this, this picture. But we are lucky to have in our collection a pair of the chairs on the left in a red laminate. Um, so a few more, a few more designers, and um, I think we may actually um, make it to the end of our scheduled time together this week. Um, I told you I was excited about this subject. There's lots of lots of wonderful work to share. So this is the work of Judy Kensley McKee. Um, Judy is an American furniture designer and maker, and um, her style, her signature is really uh, sculpted and carved animals and plant motifs. And she's been doing this work since the 1970s. So today she's based in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, she got her BFA from the Rhode Island School of Design in 1966. And she was always drawn to ancient cultures and also figurative art. So you can see those historical references in her furniture. Um, pieces like the chest on the left and on the right, these are carved in relief in wood. Uh, the one on the left is also painted, um, whereas the one on the right is simply sealed with a, a finish. The two works on the top, um, the console table and um, the little side table are both uh, sculpted in, or cast in bronze. So she, she's both, a, she's both a, a skilled woodworker and sculptor, and also in a long tradition of sculpting, works significantly in bronze. So another designer I want to share with you is Wendy Morayama. And I'm just gonna put in the chat, um, there's a really nice video interview with Wendy as well. Um, and I don't know that we have time to watch both of it. So I, both of them. So I just put it in the chat and we'll also send it out along with the video of Mira um, when we send the follow-up to the class. So um, Wendy is from Southern California and she has been making furniture for over 40 years. Watch as as you would learn if you watch the video. Um, she has also um, uh, struggled to overcome um, and work and, and work with in the context of um, of her deafness. So she is um, she is um, an advocate for um, 
for rights and, uh, and, and opportunities for people with disabilities. And she also has cerebral palsy. Um, and she talks about that in the, um, in the video. So um, she studied furniture making as an undergraduate at San Diego State and later went on to actually become a, a very influential professor there. So um, she is somebody who's whose work is should be seen in balance with the influence that she's had on others because she has really been an incredible professor. Um, in addition to San Diego State, she also studied at RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology, um, where she got a master's in furniture in furniture making. So here is um, here is one of her famous uh, earlier designs. This is from 1981, and um, Mar Mariyama was certainly coming of age around a similar time to Denise Scott Brown. So there is a similar kind of postmodern wit and play to her work, sampling from the past and also sampling from popular culture, um, as Denise Scott Brown advocated in, in uh, learning from Las Vegas. So this is the Mickey Macintosh chair. Um, and of course, this is Mickey Mouse ears on a form that was inspired by the classic high back side chair of 1898 by Charles Rennie McIntosh. So um, Wendy, I mentioned, is a very influential um, professor. And one of her younger mentors is this woman, Tanya Aviniga. Tanya uh, is Mexican. She was born and raised in Tijuana, but she has lived um, most of her life on both sides of the border with family in Mexico and family in Southern California. So she um, actually went to high school in the United States um, because her family believed that learning English um, and, and having a footing in the U.S. would help her, in, um, help her in her career. But she's somebody who holds very close the experience of living on both sides of the border um, with the privilege to be able to pass um, that not everyone, not everyone has. And um, so she studied furniture with Wendy and um, she studied furniture with Wendy Moriyama and um, Moriyama really encouraged her to go to the Rhode Island School of Design. So um, Aganiga went to RISD in Providence and for the first time in her life was in cold New England weather. And so this series of um, this series of chairs came out of her time there. She missed the the color and the the color and the warmth of Southern California and Mexico. And so um, she devised these felted chairs. So these are found standard metal folding chairs around which she hand felts. Um, and if you don't know about hand felting, it's basically massaging the wool with heat and moisture. So it takes, um, it takes about 24 hours of massaging the wool to get it to shrink around these forms. You can't collapse these chairs anymore. Um, but they're really, they're really a beautiful combination of the industrial and the handmade. Um, and here's some of her other work. You know, we, we talked about Ray Eames on the left. This is actually um, a felted Eames chair, and this is called Chair for Ray. And um, so this is in the, uh, the collection of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and Tanya made that for them. Um, she also makes a lot of commissioned wall hangings and weavings, uh, which you can see here in the background. Um, although she is a furniture maker, she is increasingly drawn to projects that activate the border. And so these pictures are from a series of work called AMBOS, A-M-B-O-S, which stands for art made between opposite sides. And you can see her with a collaborator on the other side of the border fence um, working on a weaving. Another um, Another designer, actually the same age, I'm just realizing Batil and Tanya are the same age. Um, another designer deeply influenced by, um, by weaving and, and wool is Batil Dagdalan. Uh, Batil is from Izmir, Turkey. And um, she, um, she moved to the United States, moved to New York in 2001 and started working as a set designer for fashion and film. Um, she also took classes on architecture and interior design at Parsons and um, 
in the last decade and about 2009 really got into um, weaving. And she's somebody who says uh, she's really interested in math. She loves the math of weaving. She loves um, her family in Turkey collected uh, textiles. And so she's always loved textiles from that part of the world. And she's also spent time in Mexico and Peru uh, studying indigenous weaving practices there. So her particular way of working is to have um, metal frames like this metal frame, which is from a California chair from the 1950s. Uh, and then she weaves on top of that. And um, then we're actually running out of time. I love it. So quickly, I will show you um, two more designs. This is uh, Jaesae Jung Oh, a um, Korean sculptor and furniture maker. She studied sculpture in uh, South Korea and then furniture design at Cranbrook, the school where Charles and Ray Eames met. Um, this is her initial thesis work from Cranbrook, the Savage series. So these are all found plastic objects and then um, kind of glued together. And in this case, wrapped in jute. Her most recent series wraps them in black leather. And this chair on the right is on view in Extraordinary Ordinary Things. Um, she's very interested in repackaging discarded materials and make us, making us um, look again at um, something we might discard. And then finally, a couple, um, the wonderful Israeli designers, Yael Mur and Shay Alkaleh, her husband. Um, these two came from Israel to London in the late 90s to study with Rana Rod uh, at the Royal College of Art. And, and Arad is also an Israeli Brit um, and a very famous uh, designer. And so they are, they are two of his protégés. Um, but this is a, a bench that is on view in Extraordinary Ordinary Things. Uh, you can see on the left, these little blocks of dyed wood. Um, this is a really ingenious combination of handcrafted techniques and, um, and uh, digital design. So they dye all these pieces in a pressure cooker, glue them together, and then um, this is carved by a, by a computer controlled router. So with that, having taken up officially the full class time, um, we are happy to answer questions if anybody has any. Uh, and if not, I'll just say um, thank you so much for tuning in to this series. It's been a pleasure. And um, we hope we gave you some new individuals to add to your, um, your mental list of designers to know. Rachel, I did have one question. Um, yeah. Mia Nakashima, does she have any offspring of her own or if not biological, is she in the process of passing on the knowledge that she gained from her own father? I'm just wondering in the video, it almost gave this sense of she is this both time capsule uh, and last stop shop in terms of this specific um, way of making and I'm wondering where, how the legacy of that will continue. Uh, you know, it's actually a really, it's a good question and it's an interesting one. I think it was really important to her to work on the, the National Historic Landmark designation for the site, for the studio. Um, we saw in the video a number of incredible buildings just as it kind of panned the grounds and her father built a lot of experimental architecture on the property, um, as well as you know, setting up the wood shop where they make things. Um, Mira, Mira does have offspring, but um, when last I spoke to her, they were not um, not deeply involved in the work of the studio. So I think in some ways, um, it being she knows now that it will be preserved like a museum, like a historic site in terms of um, the next generation of woodworkers? I don't know. Um, it's actually be a great question to ask her. Um, I should ask her that the next time, <laughs> the next time I see her. Um, because, you know, it's, it's never been, you know, it was never just George and it's not just Mira, right? So there are, there are undoubtedly um, people working with her who possibly could carry the torch but whether it will continue to operate as a business or not after she's done, I don't know. Um, but it's interesting things to think about uh, when we talk about family legacies.
I was just looking in the chat and these are wonderful comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and um, yeah, it looks like it looks like we just have comments. So again, thank you, Alyssa, for your question. A very good one. Um, and um, everybody have a wonderful Wednesday and tune in to future crash courses and do come visit the museum and see some of these wonderful objects in person.